six new jailers and six um, patrolmen were for his regular patrol. Well, county commission approved 30. Um, yeah, 24 um, jailers and six patrolmen. Yesterday he came to the budget committee meeting and he requested um, an amount that came to about $22,000. And in order to pay for those steps, um, the, uh, the step raises, or not step raises, for the rank increases, he was willing to uh, do without a jailer that he desperately needed. So instead of 24, he's going to receive 23, and he's going to take 22,000 out of that $68,000 that it would cost for wages, salaries, and benefits. And 22,000 he's going to use on three, um, three people that he's going to promote. And one mechanic that has we learned the other day that he he really has been a road patrolman, although he's been paid for one, and he's going to get a about a seven thousand dollar wage increase because the sheriff is afraid he's going to go elsewhere. So the ink isn't even dried on the budget, and he told us he desperately needed all these jailers, but now. One of the jailers isn't going to, that position will not come to fruition because he's going to use it for wages and salaries. So it's uh, a lot of smoke and mirrors. Uh, while I'm over here, uh, we're going to be, uh, Susan has a, a couple things she wanted to talk about. How many of you are from Loudoun County? Loudoun County. Okay. Well, some of you already know what's going on, but um, I've been here four years, and this budget process was the most dishonest I've seen. There wasn't even anything posted on the website. There was a notice put in the paper for a certain amount but the final budget ended up being um, taking like 300, 350 is it, from our rainy day fund? 3.5 million from our rainy day fund. Um, it was like a million in new spending. And the way it was done was by a gentleman's agreement. The budget committee didn't pass. I'm looking at Pat because she's... <laughs> They didn't, they didn't pass the budget, and they, they didn't want to do that because they weren't going to adhere to the published amount in the paper. And um, it was just very, very dishonest and very unfair to taxpayers, but that's kind of par for the course. Um, and they've made an obligation now that next year we will probably get a very high property tax increase, unless they have this tremendous growth that's going to make up the difference. So this is just as, you know, a lot of things have come to a head this year. There's so many problems with the way um, the commission, the school district, just government in Loudoun County, the way it's operated, it's, there's, <laughs> I'm trying to be kind. There's some nice people that are that were elected, but unfortunately, they are manipulated by one that isn't very nice. And um, he needs to be held accountable, and they all need to be held accountable because they've made some really bad decisions that have cost us a lot of money, especially for legal fees. So, um, and I personally have been attacked. Um, I won't get into that. I can tell you some other time. Uh, anybody that speaks up 
that tries to hold them accountable is um well, racist big and homophobic. <laughs> How about male children as pig? Okay. <laughs> um, but it's only because we're seeing through some people now. We know what's going on. We know their manipulations and we know what their next steps are going to be. And they don't like it that anybody knows what they're doing. So we've started, um, we had a group called Living Red in Tennessee, which is kind of a social group for villagers, but it's now changed. The new name is Patriots Reborn. Um, it was something that I was trying to start because I was afraid of Trump not winning, but we had some nice presents in Congress. <laughs> They're still there just giving us a lot of gifts. Um, showing people what the new Democrat Party is. So I have more time now for Loudoun County. On the 4th of July, I, um, I, Jim and I had breakfast with another couple that are political friends, and I said, I'm declaring war on the bad government of Loudoun County. <laughs> Our new group is going to be a political active group as well as a social group. And um, what's that saying? Um, I'm as mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore? Well, there's a few of us now, so hopefully together um, we'll have our own army that will take on Loudoun County. We'll see what happens. If people don't join us, it might be a very short war. <laughs>
cards here, and I've also got a slide of my contact info on that at the end, so you'll be able to take note of that. But um, just to, before we get started here, um, a little bit about the organization that I work for. Uh, who all here is familiar with the Heritage Foundation? Just curious to show of hands. Okay, so most of you. Awesome. That's great. Uh, for those who don't know, the Heritage Foundation is a 501c3 uh, policy think tank in Washington, D.C. Uh, they are uh, doing lots of research on all kinds of federal policy that range from uh, civil issues to economic issues to defense. It's the whole range of conservative, uh, conservative policy. So uh, if you've got uh, any kind of research that you're doing or want to know more about any kind of policy, definitely check out heritage.org, which is uh, the Heritage Foundation site. There's a wealth of, of research there, ranging all the way back to uh, 1973. So there's decades and decades of research there. Uh, but most importantly, it's timely. So uh, it's up to the date with the fights in Congress that are going right now. So definitely, if you've got questions or, or want to get more in-depth on policy, check out there. I work for Heritage Action, which is the sister organization of the Heritage Foundation. Um, so, for everyone who's heard of the foundation, how many have heard of Heritage Action before tonight? Not as many, but still a good amount, so that's awesome. Uh, so Heritage Action was uh, founded in 2010. Uh, let me back up a little bit. The foundation was started because uh, back in the day, uh, Ed Fulner, who started the uh, foundation, uh, was the executive director of the Republican Study Committee in the House. And long story short, there was a vote on, uh, uh, I think it was supersonic travel, and after the vote took place, uh, another think tank in D.C., which will remain nameless, put out a policy paper that basically laid out the pros and cons and um, you know, how members uh, should consider the issue. Well, obviously, this was after the vote had taken place, so it didn't really matter at that point. But uh, Dr. Fulner asked, well, why did, why did you guys wait until now to give us this paper? This would have been really handy for the members to have ahead of the vote, to know what they're voting on. Uh, and the think tank's response was, well, we didn't want to be seen as, as influencing Congress. Uh, that would be <laughs> unseemly of us to do. So obviously, Ed Fulner was like, okay, wait a second. There is a big need that needs to be filled here. So he left the Republican Study Committee, founded the foundation to be able to provide that uh, up-to-date uh, info. And, and the, the, uh, the goal was to be able to get good information in the hands of policymakers uh, to be able to put forth better policy. So that's the foundation. Fast forward to 2010, um, and this was right after the uh, Medicare Part D fight and, and all that, uh, and the foundation realized, okay, well, we've got this great research, uh, but sometimes it's hard to get the policymakers to really uh, kind of connect you know, our research with good policy, and it's hard for us to kind of take that last step to get them to really pay attention to it and affect the vote outcomes. So that's how Air Jackson was born. Uh, we're at 501c4, so uh, where the, uh, the foundation can say, these are good policies, Congress would do well to do these things. They can't say, Congress, you should vote yes on this bill or no on this bill. That's what we do at Air Jackson. So we can advocate on specific uh, bills in Congress. Um, and we can also do a limited amount of political activity, which we did this past election cycle. Uh, we spent some money to try to uh, help some of the uh, ended up being a public, we're not part of it, ended up being Republican members who uh, voted in favor of the tax cuts in some of those swing, uh, swing districts uh, in the 2018 election. So uh, that's what we do. We exist to take the conservative policy vision of the foundation, make, a make that a reality politically in Congress. Um, and to do that, uh, we have a couple of approaches. So uh, we do have a great team that's centered in D.C. and our headquarters in Washington, D.C., right across the street from the Senate office buildings there. Um, but uh, the real power behind an organization are uh, grassroots activists, uh, people just like you, uh, and, and we call those people sentinels. So raise your hand if you're a, a Heritage Action Sentinel. A couple, okay. Uh, so the best way that I can describe sentinels, uh, like I said, they're grassroots activists who uh, are knowledgeable on the issues, uh, they take meaningful action to hold their members of Congress accountable, uh, and they try to create an echo chamber of accountability around their members of Congress. So it's all about knowing the issues, uh, growing your skills and your influence, uh, knowing ways to influence the process, and then going out and taking action. Uh, we want to try to get as much good information into your hands as possible uh, to be able to do just that. Know the issues, grow your skills and influence, then go out and take meaningful action and make a difference. Uh, so that's our, our activist uh, side of it. We also have a great team of uh, lobbyists in DC. I know lobbyists is a kind of a dirty word. It's kind of a, a negative connotation, but 
whereas a lot of like businesses will have lobbyists in DC that are you know paid to, to talk to their friends to try to get them to pass things that will help business interests. Our lobbyists are fighting for freedom and, and liberty, uh, fighting for all of us out here for uh, constitutional uh, values and freedom and all of that. So uh, they're meeting with members of Congress and their staff on the Hill, and they're able to follow up with uh, all the great work that Sentinels do on the ground, talking to your members of Congress and their staff. Uh, and in that way, we're able to kind of surround a member with uh, all kinds of, of, of encouragement, but also um, policy information ahead of votes and uh, be able to work to strategize with them ahead of time, which is uh, over, over time really effective in getting conservative policy across the finish line. So that's a little bit about us. I don't want to spend too much time on that. If you've got questions about it later, um, definitely come, uh, come up to me afterwards. Uh, but I did want to mention uh, on everyone's table there should be a card that looks like this. If you're interested in getting more information about the Sentinel program, it's totally free, it costs nothing. Uh, it is literally if you have any time that you want to devote to knowing federal issues better and reaching out to members of Congress, uh, uh, working to try to get conservative policy enacted at the federal level, uh, this is a great way to do that. Uh, so definitely feel free to fill this out, get it back to me before you leave tonight, and I'll be sure to follow up with you over email and get you plugged in. Um, and Sentinels every week, uh, we have a Sentinel strategy call on Monday evenings uh, from uh, 5.30 to 6 o'clock. Um, it's always 30 minutes, uh, there about, well, not always, sometimes it's 31 minutes. Never, we never go past 6.02 though, so we'll get you off the phone by then. Uh, it's a live conference call with our Vice President Jessica Anderson, uh, and usually our grassroots director Janae Strachey, who you see on the screen here, um, and they give uh, uh, an update on what's going on in the Hill that week. Now this is not an update that you're going to get on you know, Fox News or, or kind of scrounging pieces up on the internet. This is inside baseball. This is. Uh, really process focused on, on mainly the House representatives but also the Senate. Um, this is uh, kind of st uh, a strategy. It's also, okay, what can we do as grassroots activists this week to be effective and pair that with the leverage points that we have in the House to be able to get things across the finish line uh, and, and make, make progress. So once you're a Sentinel, like I said, it's totally free to join. We have a great Facebook page here called Harry Jackson Sentinel nation where you can watch live streams of the call or if you're ever not around the phone at 5.30, um, you can always go and check out the, the call after the fact. We've got the live stream for the video up there uh, to review after the fact. So that's for Sentinels. Um, you'll get timely email updates if there's an important vote coming up uh, to, to be sure to reach out to your member of Congress, uh, call alerts and that sort of thing. But uh, more importantly, we want to try to keep everyone up to date on policy. And that's what I'm here to talk about tonight is some policy. Um, before I get to that, I did want to mention, uh, for those who are Sentinels, uh, who raised your hands earlier, have y'all been to Sentinel Summits in the past? Yes, would you recommend them? Yes. They say yeah, absolutely yes. I paid them to say that. Uh, I'm, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Uh, no, Sentinel Summits are a great time for Sentinels to get together, um, to uh, uh, hear from policy experts or members of Congress or uh, administration officials, but also our great Heritage Action team, uh, network with one another, spend some time, uh, it's really like a family gathering, and I think you two probably agree. Um, so in the past we've done large national ones, but now this year we're doing more regional ones. We happen to have one in Atlanta, uh, November 9th. It's going to run, it's a Saturday, it runs from 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. I know it's a little trek from here, but uh, I've heard from lots of Sentinels in Tennessee, and they're planning on going to the Atlanta Summit. So if you want to get uh, plugged in with more uh, Tennessee Sentinels, this is definitely a great time to get together with them all in one central location. We're going to have some great speakers. Um, and, and maybe some, uh, some hometown heroes from this part. I can't name any names yet, but it uh, should be a good speaker list. Um, definitely uh, keep that on your calendars, and you'll see more information later, uh, but I uh, want to bring that to your attention tonight. So now I want to dive into uh, some policy, which is my, the main reason for my being here tonight. Um, on your tables, you've got uh, one pager uh, about the Born Alive Abortion Survivor Protection Act. Um, Everything that's on the paper, I'm more or less going to summarize pretty quickly, so don't worry about reading it in depth now, but you've got it in paper form if you want, or info later if you want to just you know, jog your memory uh, or share with others. And I'll share some of uh, my extra copies before I leave as well if you want some extras. But uh, the Born Alive Bill it is an important piece of legislation, here's why. Uh, under current federal law, uh, the Born Alive Infants Protection Act of 2002, which was a law that was signed by uh, George W. Bush, um, it basically clarifies that for the purposes of federal law, every infant who's born alive at any stage of development is a person uh, under federal law. 
Now, that's great, but it does not specify the obligations surrounding the duty of care for those infants. So, let me put this in, in, in different words. Right now, uh, every day, babies are born as a result of a failed abortion, and under current law, there is nothing that basically requires uh, abortion providers to provide care to try to save that infant's life. And oftentimes, they're either left to die uh, or, unfortunately, actively killed. I mean, let's call it what it is. That's murder. That's not even... We're not talking about abortions. We're talking about a baby that is alive outside the mother's womb at this point. They're born, uh, and they're letting them die, uh, just not given any medical care. Unfortunately, this happens all too often. Um, and, in fact, it happens often enough that there are actually support groups of uh, people who are born under these circumstances, who are now adults, uh, perfectly healthy adults, and, um, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them who are in these support groups all around the country. So this happens all the time. Uh, I heard a story of a nurse who uh, worked at a hospital in, uh, in Chicago. Ironically, it's called, I think, Christ Hospital near Chicago. Uh, well, they do, they perform late-term abortions at that hospital. Uh, and she was a, a nurse uh, in that uh, part of the hospital wing, and she said that all the time they would perform abortions, and uh, babies would be born as a result, and they would be alive. Um, and unfortunately, they, the common practice there was to wrap them up in a dirty sheet, take them to a medical supply closet, sit them on a shelf, close the door, and then wait for them to die. And that happened all the time. And she tells a, she tells a story that. Uh, this one time, uh, she had just had enough. Uh, a little baby boy was born under these circumstances as a result of a failed abortion. Uh, just like always, they wrapped him up and took him to the closet. And she couldn't stand the thought of him dying alone, so she went in there and held him in her hand. And he was, she guessed he was probably about 24, 25 weeks. I mean, old enough to survive with just medical, regular medical care. Um, in fact, I saw a news piece uh, just a couple weeks ago, and if it was born at 22 weeks, survived. so uh, 25 weeks is nowhere outside the realm of possibility of saving. And she couldn't stand the thought of him dying alone in that closet, so she held it in her hand for the 57 minutes that it took for him to die. Uh, as he struggled for breath, he you know, wasn't making a whole lot of noise, she said, because he was struggling to breathe, uh, and unfortunately he did pass, but uh, she was eventually fired from that position because she made it known what was going on there. Um, and as a result of some of the, the outcry that obviously uh, came up as, as a result, uh, they now have what they call a comfort room, where instead of a supply closet with dirty medical waste uh, and dirty sheets, now they've got a space where when a baby's born as a result of an abortion, they take them to that comfort room, they basically sedate them, they wrap them up in a blanket and just let them die. It's more or less just sugarcoating uh, what we all know to be murder. And unfortunately, stuff like that happens around the country every day. Uh, and there's perverse incentives for abortion providers like Planned Parenthood and others to do this because they've got uh, uh, financial incentives to try to have uh, commit as many abortions as possible because that's how they make uh, the lion's share of their revenue. So this is a, an issue that obviously needs addressing from a policy standpoint. That's what the Born Alive Abortion Survivor Protection Act, which is uh, the, the, on the paper that I gave you tonight, uh, would do. So it would uh, do five major things. One is require that healthcare practitioners uh, exercise the same degree of professional skill, care, and diligence to preserve the life and health of a child born alive following an abortion as a practitioner would render to any other child born alive. Uh, that seems really common sense. Uh, unfortunately, there current federal law, and that we need to take that a step further to protect these, these infants. It would, uh, number two, require that healthcare practitioners ensure that the child born alive is immediately transported to uh, a hospital. I mean, it, it could be as simple as calling 911, seeking regular medical care that would be provided to anybody else who needed uh, emergency services. Uh, number three, it would require practitioners uh, or the hospital or the physician's office or any abortion clinic uh, employees to report violations. Um, so. Uh, right now, we know that this happens uh, hundreds of times a year, but it's likely that it happens thousands, if not tens of thousands of times. Uh, but right now, obviously, there is no incentive, in fact, a negative incentive for these abortion providers to uh, report this. Uh, now, if they fail to report it under the, the Born Alive Act here, it would establish criminal penalties, which include fines and or imprisonment uh, for uh, the abortion providers for failure to comply. Uh, 
And lastly, it would bar prosecution of the mother of the child, um, and it would provide her with uh, basically civil remedies to uh, be able to sue and obtain relief against the person who committed uh, the violation. So uh, that's that's the, the meat of the bill. That's what it does. Um, like I said, there's currently a gap in federal law where these babies are defined as people, but there's no required duty of care uh, of these abortion providers. Uh, now, I, I personally believe that abortion is murder in all instances. This is not even really about abortion. This is about babies born alive and, and they're alive on their own. Uh, now you think, well, this is crazy. Who could be up against something like this? Um, actually, you're, you're right. It's about an 80-20 issue. 77% of voters uh, support legislation that does just what I described here. Um, in the realm of politics, an 80-20 issue is a slam dunk, okay? This is, um, if you're a politician, think about this. Uh, on just about everything that you do, uh, out of, I don't know, the 30 people in this room, 15 are gonna, gonna hate you for doing whatever you do every time you do anything, right? Well, this issue, 80-20, this is a winning issue for both sides, right? This is not even a, a partisan issue. And this 77% is not Republican voters, it's not conservatives. These are all Americans uh, in a uh, scientifically representative poll here. So, as you can see, this is not just uh, a partisan issue. It's not even uh, a, 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 you know, a 55, 45 split, it's an 80, 20 split, which by all accounts should be um, a home run. Now, Republicans have requested this bill to get a vote on the House floor. Uh, and as of the end of last week, they had done so 69 times, but Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, has refused to let it come to a vote on the House floor because she knows that her Democratic members would vote no on this. And then, be on the record, in favor of killing babies after they're born. And that's what this is literally about. Um, as you can tell, uh, this is not, that's not a tenable position <laughs> for any member of Congress to be in, especially not heading into a, uh, a presidential election year that already carries so many consequences for both sides, depending on how that ends up, right? So, she's wary of getting her members on record uh, opposing this. Now you'd ask, okay, well it's an 80-20 issue, why would they oppose this? Um, unfortunately, the incentives in D.C. are set up, um, and, and Planned Parenthood and the abortion lobby in general is a very, very powerful uh, lobby for the Democratic caucus. Um, every year, they donate tens of millions of dollars uh, to Democratic candidates, uh, who then will go into Congress and then be sure that uh, no measure passes that would either strip funding or make uh, providing abortions more difficult. And they argue that this, this does that, and so therefore we are against it. Uh, so that's why Democrats are opposed. Now, luckily we don't need an up or down vote on the floor to get them on record, uh, but even so, we still like to get one, right? Well, there is a way to do that. Now, under the normal committee process, a bill will uh, be written, introduced by a member, it'll then be read and then uh, uh, sent to a committee with jurisdiction, where then if it is a Democratic or, or the, the majority leader, the majority party's uh, priority there, they will then have hearings, markups, amend it, and send it to the floor for passage. Well, if it's not a Democrat priority because they happen to be in the majority right now, it goes to committee and then literally just, just dies there. Just like 10,000 other bills in every Congress. Um, now that's where this bill stands right now, but thankfully we can bypass that entire process uh, and force a vote on the House floor uh, through what's called a discharge petition. So what that would do is skip the committee process, and if, uh, if they are able to get 218 signatures, just a, a bare majority in the House of Representatives, uh, to sign this discharge petition, uh, it would require that an up or down vote be held on the floor within a certain number of legislative days. Um, so right now, uh, the discharge petition has been uh, introduced by uh, Minority Whip Steve Scalise, and it was, I think, the first or second week of April that it was introduced. And it currently has 201 signatures, so we're 17 signatures short. Now about 201, uh, that's more signatures than there are Republicans in the House. So there are three Democrats signed on to this right now. It's already bipartisan, uh, which is a big step towards getting more Democrats, but unfortunately, uh, these remaining 17 signatures that we need are going to have to come from Democrats because all the Republicans have signed up. Um, with that said, uh, the ask obviously now here where we have you know a lot of Republican members, especially on the, the east side of Tennessee, um, it's it's 
not necessarily talking to your member. Um, your member obviously has already signed on here, but uh, all Democrats need to be signed on to this, especially ones that represent swing districts or uh, states that uh, voted for Trump uh, in, in 2016 or are likely to do so in 2020. So talk to your Democratic uh, family, friends, or, or uh, members of Congress, really anyone, Talk about the horrors of what's going on with this issue. These babies that are born alive every day as a result of abortions and just either left to die or killed. Uh, we've got to do something, and uh, right now Democrats are in an untenable position. So whether or not we get the 218 signatures, which I wish I could tell you it's likely, it may not be. Uh, even if we fail to get the 218, we have them on record right now already with this discharge petition. Because to sign on, they have to go to the House floor and they have to literally sign their name on the piece of paper that says they are in favor of this bill. Now, right now, 201 members of the House of Representatives, uh, all Republicans and three Democrats, are on record in favor of this bill. They are on record in favor of saving babies. Right now, 232 Democrats in the House of Representatives are on record in favor of killing babies after they're born. That's the reality of this. They're on record, so we need to be able to use this to talk about the issue. But more importantly, take it to the voters and say, look, look what they're in favor of. Look what they're in favor of here. They're standing for killing babies outside the womb, and we need to call it what it is, talk about the horrors that they're uh, trying to push here. So that's the issue. Is, is, are there questions? Um, I can go into more detail. Um, any questions that you have on the Born Live Act before we go to the next one? Mm -hmm. um, does the website indicate who has signed? Yes. So uh, I actually pulled this. This is a screenshot from. Uh, a website that Heritage Action uh, built. So you can go to heritageaction.com and this will be one of the top things that you see on the web page. And you will be able to see a list of all the members under each column. Uh, you'll be able to, and like I said, all the Republicans have signed on. We still need eight, uh, 17 more Democrats, um, but the 232 are the ones who have not yet signed. So you'll find that, you can find that at heritageaction.com and that link is at the bottom of that one pager that you have on this issue. So. Um, if you have more questions on this issue or any other issue in Congress, definitely check that out. Feel free to reach out to me and I can point you in the right direction. But that's a really good question. So thanks for that. Sure. Go for the one too much here. Number five on your one slide where it's up to the right there. Okay. So is this saying that if a woman goes to have an abortion and the baby survives, that then she can turn around and take civil action against the abortionist? Correct. If they fail to call 911, get an ambulance to come, take the baby to a hospital, or provide medical care that they would provide to any other baby born at that gestational age. Yeah, that's correct. Even though she went there with the specific correct. purpose of getting rid of the baby? Correct. Okay. I understand why that may seem why that may sound weird to some of you. Um, there are some, uh, especially at the state level, there are some bills that um, would seek to like, criminalize uh, mothers who seek abortions and basically make them uh, you know, open to criminal charges uh, for seeking an abortion. Uh, that's not the approach this bill takes. Uh, it's a tragedy anytime any mother makes this decision. And the reality is a lot of mothers, they're not, they're not just making the decision because they want to kill their baby. A lot of mothers feel like they have no other choice. Um, it's really tragic, and we need to be able to point to alternatives like adoption and all kinds of other uh, uh, other ways to deal with this issue. But uh, we don't want to criminalize these mothers who unfortunately made that terrible decision, uh, and they're going to have to live with that. But if the baby is born alive, and, and like I said, this happens all the time, uh, are you all familiar with the organization called Live Action? Okay, they do undercover videos, kind of like Project Veritas. Um, and there was a, uh, they did one video about this issue. Uh, there was a, a heavily pregnant mother who was probably eight, well, no, she was probably seven months pregnant at that point. She was easily in the third trimester. She was seeking an abortion and asked the person, okay, well, what if it, what if it doesn't work? Like, what if, what if the baby like, is breathing and stuff? And they said, don't worry, like, we'll take care of it. Um, she said, well, what happens if, you know, I go home and the baby comes out and he, He's alive. Uh, and they said, well, if, if that happens, don't worry. Just, just put him in a bag, bring him over to the facility, and we'll be sure that he's taken care of and he'll be gone. So this happens all the time. It's a really tragic thing that people are pushing mothers to make this choice. But the reality is these organizations are 
pushing mothers in that direction. They rarely, rarely, if ever, uh, talk about adoptions or any of the other choices, the pregnancy centers that are oftentimes free that can help these mothers in other certain scenarios. But um, this happens all the time, unfortunately. But we want to be able to. I got a question back here. Yep, yeah, and then I'll come right back up here. What actions is Heritage taking to pressure the rest of the Democrats to vote for this uh, bill? Good question. So, or I should say discharges. Yes, yes. Uh, very good question, and like I said earlier, uh, the Democrats who we think are the most likely to sign off of this are the ones who uh, right now represent red-leaning districts. So a great example would be uh, Lucy McBath in Georgia, who won Karen Handel's seat right outside of Atlanta, Joe Cunningham, who now sits in Mark Sanford's seat in Charleston, South Carolina. Those types of seats where they're red-leaning districts in red states where their constituents already are pro-life. Now, even in districts where any Democrat, uh, it could even be Democratic leaning, odds are that probably about 70% of the people in that district are in favor of this bill. Uh, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about public perception. We need to talk about the fact that um, with all of the, the comments, especially with uh, the Virginia Governor Ralph Northam, his comments about uh, literally infanticide, baby, the scenario that I just laid out, let's say a baby's born, um, if it's the day of the baby, you know, a conversation would be had between the mother and the, the doctor, and they'll figure out what they want to do, aka decide whether or not they want to kill the baby. And that's infanticide, that's murder, that's what we're talking about here. Um, all the laws that are being passed in New York and Vermont and these other states uh, that are okaying abortions all the way up to the day of birth, uh, and, and in a lot of cases making it easy for them to get away with things like this, uh, it has awoken this issue in the public consciousness. We've seen the polling flip. I mean, it's I think it's on somewhere along 17% in favor of life just in the first quarter of this year alone after those comments. So uh, the good news is things are shifting in the right direction. But we, to your question, we need to be talking about the fact that hey, uh, people are not in favor of, of this. This is an atrocity, um, and even in Democrat districts, that 77% that I showed you there, uh, it's like 85 percent of Republicans, but it's 70 percent of Democrats. It's not a small number. So um, they don't really have a leg to stand on when it comes to their arguments uh, against this bill. Um, the last thing I'll mention on, on the polling here, 62 percent of voters oppose legislation to allow late-term abortions. So yes, the Born Alive bill is not talking about abortions, but even if you, so if you ask people, are you pro-life or pro-choice, it breaks down close to about 50, low 50s to high 40s, right? But if you ask people, okay, do you oppose uh, abortion after, you know, the third trimester, basically up to the day of birth, that's very, very unpopular. And here, 62% of voters oppose that. So uh, the later you get into pregnancy, the less that they want that. So we need to be talking about those realities when it comes to public perception and showing just how out of step Democrats are with people in their own districts. And that's how they will be forced to care. Great question there. Are there others? Got one here. Yep, here, and then I'll come back to there. I don't know how many saw the movie. Unwanted? Unplanned? 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 Yeah. Did you have anything to do with that movie? Because that is a powerful movie. I did not. Uh, I know that um, the founder of My Pillow, uh, if you've seen the commercials and stuff, I'm, I think he advertised a lot on Fox News. He actually uh, donated a lot of money towards making that, so he gets a lot of credit for that. The studio that made it makes a lot of credit, uh, gets a lot of credit for that. The actresses, and more importantly, the story they're told gets a lot of credit for that. But no, we, we did not play a part. Awesome. Is there any way to put this on the national ballot, of our state ballots, of vote for the people? So, this is a federal, uh, a federal bill. Um, that's what we're pushing for here. Although there are state led pushes on this. So several states have, have tried to do this, um, whether it be uh, foreign live bills, but more commonly there are like heartbeat bills. And I know there was one in Tennessee and in this uh, past uh, session. There's one in Georgia, one in Alabama, and North Carolina passed one out of both chambers, but the governor vetoed it and they were not able to overcome the veto. But this is definitely a state fight just as much as it is a federal. This is just for purposes of federal law to say, hey, okay, to clarify what that 2002 Born Alive law said, here is the duty of care to save these infants. Um, but yes, states can do more, and they should do more, but that's obviously at the state level. Um, but this is the federal response to this particular issue. Good question. Yeah, 
fairly cynical. Uh, there's 31 or so Democrats that flipped the House. Obviously, you guys know who they are. Now, you mentioned Project Veritas. I saw that they did undercover work <clears throat> on videos on senators, and they're like, yeah, we tell them whatever the hell we need to say. I believe that a percentage of those House members did the same thing. And this would be a damn good way to call them out. If they're as conservative, centrist as they claim to be, and you give them an 80 20 bill, hey, you're centrist, 80 20. It's teed up for them. I mean, it's very okay, easy to get Are you doing that, that, though? Yes. Okay. So, uh, of the ones who, uh, you know, there are, uh, I'd be hard pressed to name specific members off the top of my head. Don't name names, just you yes. know who they are. Yes. Our strategy, yes, our strategy is to know what a member ran on, what kinds of things did they say on the campaign trail, uh, what people do they listen to in their districts. We're not just trying to go with, with blunt force, grassroots pressure. I mean, yes, that's part of it, but our strategy is try to be smarter than that. Like, okay, what are their particular arguments against this? How do we address or respond to those particular arguments? And then how do we show them if they did make a statement on the campaign trail that they're now totally at, at odds with, point that out, uh, and take that to voters, and then have that be left up for people to decide on. But yes, the answer to your question is yes. I go back to the sledgehammer. If you want the house back, even if they didn't campaign on it, you can say, hey. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so blunt force drama. Absolutely. Yep. I've got one back here. One more back here. And then if you if we've got more, we'll come back to it at the end. I do want to go to the next one, but if you've got the questions, um, jot it down and we'll come back to it at the end. But yes, back here. Three quick things I wanted to also share about that movie and the plan and just the story of Abby Johnson. I heard she was a Planned Parenthood clinic director and her eyes were finally open to what all was going on with Planned Parenthood. Today, um, Dr. Lena Wynn, I believe, who is over the entire Planned Parenthood, was fired in a secret meeting. They had secret meetings and so forth going on. If those who believe in prayer need to pray for this woman, um, Abby Johnson has called for prayer for her and reached out to talk to her and say, I understand about these secret meetings. Of course, they sued Abby Johnson and all that. And, um, you know, somehow maybe this, this lady might turn around and, and go to the other side. That would be huge. Yeah, sure. That would be powerful. And thankfully, as a result of this movie, a lot of Planned Parenthood uh, uh, employees have quit their jobs because they realize, oh my gosh, that's the kind of things we're doing here. Yes. So, yes. Abby Johnson formed an organization called And Then There Were None, meaning And Then There Were No Employees of the Abortion Industry. And then you all may have covered this because we uh, kind of got here. Uh, a little bit late, but taxpayer funds still going to this. So what can be done about that? That's a more complicated question. So it's technically a separate issue, but the short answer is, um, so the Trump administration has gone after some of those funds. Now there's a large bucket and there are a couple different buckets of funds that go to Planned Parenthood. Some of it's easier to get to than other funds. Um, the specifics of that gets really in the weeds of Title X funding and a bunch of other things. Um, so the administration has started that, but it's going to have to come through Congress. So there are uh, every every year, uh, anytime they pass an appropriations bill, usually there's a, an amendment called the Hyde Amendment that is attached to that. It basically disallows uh, taxpayer money from directly funding abortion. Now, unfortunately, uh, what, millions and millions of dollars of taxpayer money goes to Planned Parenthood anyway every year, uh, but it's just it can't be directly spent on abortion right now. But money's fungible. Uh, so, for example, here, let's say this business brings in ten thousand dollars. Well, that's ten thousand dollars they don't have to spend on the light bill or the water bill. They can spend it on whatever else they want, right? The same thing is true with Planned Parenthood. So, for these tens of millions of dollars that they're getting every year, uh, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Uh, that's money they're not having to spend on rent at their locations. That's not money they're spending on salaries and uh, legal fees. Uh, and then that frees up more money in their budget to spend on performing abortions. Uh, it's a real issue. It's tough to get at, but it's going to take the political will of members of Congress making that a fight, sticking up to the abortion lobby, and 
uh, in the House of Representatives right now, because they control the process, it's going to have to start in the Senate. Now, I wish I could say it's likely under divided uh, Congress, but it's not. Um, the, the way that we do this is to point out the absurdity of what's going on, make it toxic in the minds of the American people, and at some point, people are not going to stand for this anymore. And it's got to—it's got to change. We have to change hearts and minds before we can start changing dollars on, on the spreadsheet. In other words, got great one, questions. Got one more. One more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll sure. One more, and then we'll, we'll go to the next. One. Okay. Can the uh, abortion clinic counter the liability by forcing the woman who's seeking abortion to say, "Hey, sign this uh, waiver form. Uh, you can't sue us." To, uh, so that would not, uh, that, that may disallow her from, from suing them civilly, which or the way that she can get uh, uh, recourse for that. that. They can't have somebody sign away a paper that then keeps them from having to abide by the other four things that this does, right? So they would still have to exercise the same care, call 911, provide care, if not, call 911, report. The mother signing a piece of paper can't make federal law go away, so they would still have to do that. Yeah, uh, a good question. Well, yes, if you have more questions on the Born Alive bill, uh, drop them down. We'll come back to them uh, at the end. I want to get to the next one, uh, the next issue that I want to talk about tonight. It's called the Equality Act. It's H.R. 5. Yeah. Judging from the caption, you guys already know what this craziness is, which is a good thing. Uh, I just want to go into a little bit more depth and be sure you know where it stands. Um, before we get into this, I want to go through a couple of terms that we'll use. So the first one is sexual orientation. Uh, pretty self-explanatory, but it's, it's an emotional, romantic, or sexual attraction to other people, right? Uh, gender identity is one's innermost concept of self as male, female, a blend of both, or neither. Um, okay. It's how individuals perceive themselves and what they call themselves. Okay, so that's very circular, that definition. It's not a very great definition, but that's the best that, that anyone can come up with. But uh, sexual orientation and gender identity are two of the terms that I'm going to be talking about with this bill. So HR5 uh, would add sexual orientation and gender identity, or SOGI for short, uh, those two classes, uh, as protected, uh, uh, protected classes under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So the Civil Rights Act, um, it's, it's the one that basically, anytime you deal with an insurance company or an employer or applying for, for benefits or anything like that, it says we do not discriminate on the basis of uh, sex, race, religion, that, right? HR 5 would add sexual orientation and gender identity to that list. Um, and that has some pretty devastating consequences, uh, as we'll see here. Um, it would force schools, churches, hospitals, businesses, really anything that operates in the public square, uh, to recognize an individual's chosen gender instead of their biological sex. Now that's, I mean, when it comes down to trying to figure out what that means for the sake of law, it gets pretty squirrely here. Um, but it would also explicitly reduce current religious liberty protections in law. So it would basically prioritize what someone thinks they are or says they are in one moment. It, keep in mind, it could always change five minutes from now. Um, it prioritizes that over one's religious beliefs, one's moral beliefs, all those things that are currently uh, up to one to decide for themselves. And that's a First Amendment thing, right? That's not even, that's not even law, that's, that's literally our rights. Uh, so, the problem with this is SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity are, by their very definition, they're very fluid, right? The definitions that I read to you are not exactly easy to nail down, okay, well, how do we know what somebody thinks they are in this moment? Is it the same now as it is five minutes from now? Is that the same as it was ten years ago? And is it the same that it'll be ten years from now? No. It can change at any moment. It's literally just what someone identifies as in that moment. Uh, now, it becomes difficult to determine what constitutes discrimination on that basis, right? I mean, let's say that um, someone uh, comes to your business and feels discriminated against because you, you said, hey, how are you doing today, sir? When in reality, they prefer to be called uh, uh, madam or whatever it is, right? Uh, that would theoretically be discrimination. Uh, by the way, this law is written, right? It's you discriminate against them based on their uh, uh, gender identity, which is which is crazy. It's very hard to, to figure out how this works, right? 
But these categories also implicate conduct, uh, especially when it comes to sexual orientation, uh, which is something on which citizens can reasonably disagree. Right? Like this is not, uh, you know, I happen to be a white male. I was born that way. I can't change that, and I have no desire to. But you can easily look at me and tell that I am a white male. Right? You cannot easily look at someone and determine what their sexual orientation is. Um, there are ways in which uh, uh, very reasonable and, and I would argue well within their rights people would say, hey, like, I don't agree with, with you know, actions that those people take. I should not be forced or coerced by the government to either help them do those things or what have you. Fortunately, that would be illegal under this. So that's what we're talking about here. But it's a discrimination or difference of opinion. That's not something that should be a federal law saying you must do this. If not, you are you are run afoul of the federal government, and therefore uh, you are open to uh, obviously punishment in that, in that regard. This this has wide ranging or not, has wide ranging um, things that this does to nonprofits, businesses, and we'll run through some of these uh, uh, examples of how this is negative here, negative consequences. Um, Already, state and local SOGI laws have shut down faith-based adoption agencies who, you know, maybe let's say they're, I think one is Bethany Adoption Services, uh, where they adopt kids into families with both a mother and a father because they're faith-based, they are Bible-believing, they believe that Scripture is the, the Word of God and that it means what it says it means, and therefore they try to serve in that way. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to serve in their communities and live out their faiths. Well, the government in some states, uh, including Pennsylvania, New York, Illinois, California, Massachusetts, and the District of Columbia, uh, have laws in the books that are just like H.R. 5, that include sexual orientation and gender identity as uh, protected classes. Organizations like those have been sued in these, in these states, and basically forced with the choice of uh, go against your deeply held legitimate religious beliefs, or shut your doors and help no children. You choose. Um, that's unfortunately the force that they're the choice that they're forced to make here. It's happening already at the state level, and if HR5 were to go into effect, it would be a nationwide thing. Okay. <clears throat> Business owners. This is a picture of Jack Phillips, who is the uh, Colorado uh, cake baker who recently won a Supreme Court case. Um, Unfortunately, the Supreme Court ruling was pretty narrow, uh, so it, it didn't say, "Hey, he's completely right. You can't do, you can't discriminate against somebody because of their religious beliefs." He has just as much right to not bake a cake that says some, you know, nasty slogan on it uh, that goes against his religious beliefs. You can't force him to do that and make art with his God given talent that he doesn't want to make. It's freedom of speech. That's not what the Supreme Court said. They said the. Uh, the, the board in Colorado, because in Colorado, SOGI is on the books, these SOGI laws are on the books. The, uh, the board that basically brought him up on these charges, uh, they made such crazy anim animist statements against his religious beliefs that the Supreme Court ruled that they could not possibly have been uh, fairly adjudicating this case. Right? So the second that, that court case came up, their the opinion came out, uh, the very next day, that, that board brought them up on a new charge, and basically they're not going to make any dumb statements publicly that will show that they have obvious animus towards his beliefs. Uh, that's the way they get around this. But what's happened to Jack Phillips, and by the way, he's already been sued a couple of other times since this case has been resolved, the left is going after him to personally destroy him and his business. He's already lost something like 40 or 50 percent of his sales. Um, he's probably going to end up having to close the business at some point, but he can't. That's not sustainable. Um, and the left is just totally targeting him because of his religious beliefs. Make no mistake that's happening at the state level already, and they're successful. They see that this is a way to either shut people up or force them out of business, force them out of the public square. That's going to continue. Okay, the left is going to use this as a weapon, and HR 5 would make this law on the books in the entire country. It would decide it up and down whether you know Tennessee agrees with Colorado. Who cares? It's federal law. That's, that's the stakes here. It gets worse though. So medical professionals, they would be affected because the Equality Act would force hospitals and insurers to provide and pay for gender-affirming treatments. Okay, so gender-affirming treatment. I put that in quotes because I mean it's that's the term the left uses. What we're talking about is hormone injections, uh, double mastectomies for young girls who think that they're boys, 
before they reach puberty. Um, uh, 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 irreversible surgeries uh, that cannot be undone uh, on children. Oftentimes children, and this is a part of growing up, a non-zero, I mean it's, it's probably the 20-ish percent range of children at some point in their very formative years between two and six, sometimes think, oh, like, you know, I like to, I don't, I'm, maybe I'm a boy, I like to play with, with dolls, or maybe I'm a girl and don't like to play with dolls, I like to climb trees. And they start to question themselves, right? That's called gender dysphoria sometimes. Uh, and trust me, doctors and, and the left love to diagnose as many people with this as they can. But unfortunately, under this, uh, hospitals and insurers would be required to provide and pay for gender affirming therapies that would basically help those children make a transition to the other sex, right? Now, the sad thing is, these feelings are pretty common among children. But it's also extremely common in the high 90% range of these children who have these feelings to within a year or so, they totally go away. They're not experiencing gender dysphoria anymore. Well, if a girl has had a double mastectomy or a hysterectomy, good luck you know, going back and, and you know, being a fully functioning uh, female uh, again. That's the stakes that we're talking about here. And it's not just for um, moral objections that they would be forced to do this. Even doctors who think that this is not good science, because I mean, the way that I've described it is obviously not good science, even over medical objections, they would be forced to do this. So doctors are going to be forced to either perform these types of procedures or do not practice medicine. If you thought that's bad, it gets even worse, right? Parental rights is, is another way that this touches every part of society. Already in Ohio that has SOGI laws on the books, a judge removed a girl from her parents' custody after they declined to uh, provide her with uh, gender-affirming treatments and literally charged them with child neglect and abuse. They revoked their parental rights, they took their daughter away from them, the court did, the state of Ohio did, and charged them with child abuse and neglect. That happened in Ohio. Let's say HR 5 goes into effect at the federal level, that would happen nationwide. If parents uh, you know, let's say, um, you know, my child one day gets to be about three or four years old and decides, hey, like, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm a girl or a boy, and, and it's feeling the opposite, experiences gender dysphoria. Unless I take him to the doctor, and, and once I take him to the doctor and he, and he gets diagnosed with gender dysphoria, unless I consent to those, tra those transitions, I stand to lose my parental rights, have my child taken away from me, and being charged with child abuse and neglect. Um, that, those are the stakes we're talking about. It's absolutely crazy. It's insane. Curriculum in schools to be touched. Uh, so it would add sexual orientation and gender identity as a protected class uh, and lead to potential changes in curriculum, whether it be sex ed or, or history. Already, in five states in D.C., they've already mandated that SOGI curricula uh, be put in place. So in New Jersey, California, and Illinois, they already are mandated to teach sexual orientation and gender identity history, whatever that means. In Colorado, Washington, and the District of Columbia, they are required by law to teach sexual orientation as part of sex education and gender identity as a part of sex education for uh, all the way to California just put one in place uh, a couple weeks ago. They're literally teaching like fourth and fifth graders alternate, alternate methods of having sex to avoid getting Married, same-sex relationships, gender identity. That's the states that we're dealing with here. On the other side of that coin, there are, there are 10 states um, that have prohibited SOGI curriculum. Now, okay, in, in this country, we have a, a cool thing called federalism, where some states can do stupid things, and if they want to do that, fine. If our state wants to do something different, it's up to the people of that state to decide, right? Well, if HR5 goes into place, these 10 states down here will be told, okay, we'll take a hike, Federal law now says you have to do these things, otherwise it's discrimination, you can't do that. Um, so these 10 states that have prohibited SOGI curriculum will be told to take a hike and they will be impacted in that way. Women, girls, and students will be impacted. Basically, HR 5 is not about equality at all, but what it would do is totally destroy any uh, private space that, that women have, whether it be bathrooms, whether it be locker rooms, whether it be a crazy example is Let's say you have kids or grandkids in school who are school age and they have an overnight trip, like a field trip somewhere. Um, if there is, let's say your, your daughter is going on that trip, there happens to be a boy in the school who identifies as a female 
he would then have to be placed in a room overnight with girls. That's, that's an easily uh, true example of how this works here. Uh, it would destroy female-only spaces, and, and it doesn't stop in schools. It's everywhere. It's crazy. And make no mistake that this is not just a legislative push. This is in culture. Uh, they're coming at kids and, and all of us from every direction. This past month of June was Pride Month, right? Almost every business you can think of, their logo was a rainbow flag uh, trying to promote uh, uh, the LGBTQI plus whatever agenda, right? They're bludgeoning us over the heads with this, and they're not just trying to say, hey, you do this or we're not going to like you. They're literally telling people like Jack Phillips, hey, agree with us or be destroyed. Those are the stakes that we're talking about here when it comes to HR5. Now, this is very un, uh, unpopular. I know these words are very small. I'm not going to read them all for the interest of time, but almost no matter how you cut down and talk about this issue, it's unpopular, along the lines of about 80 to 20, just like the Born on Life Act, right? It's about 82% disagree with doing it for privacy and safety reasons. Uh, about 80% of people agree that the government would make it worse, that the federal government shouldn't mandate that all the way down. Uh, even if you start talking about uh, nonprofits and, and charities being able to choose how they serve, still 65% of people agree that if Bethany Adoption Agency wants to serve their community in that way, they should totally have the right to do that. Just if another adoption agency wants to only adopt to same-sex couples, I mean, you know, to each his own, kids would be adopted, but you know, the left would say, hey, no, Bethany Services, you cannot do that. You cannot do that. You have to either bow to this altar of uh, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, or close your doors and no longer exist. When you start talking about parents and doctors uh, being affected, uh, when it comes to parents losing their custody, 73% of people agree that's absurd. Business owners should not be forced to pay for uh, sex reassignment surgeries that, that might violate their beliefs. Again, 70% disagree with that. Um, medical professionals being forced to perform these surgeries, uh, 68%, again, almost 70% of people think that's crazy. Um, and when you start talking about locker room stuff, 63% of people disagree. Right? When you start talking about how this impacts women and parental rights, medical it touches every aspect of, of our life in the public square. Um, and Democrats are totally out of lockstep because guess what? HR5 already passed the House of Representatives. Okay, it's an 80 20 issue. No matter how you cut it, it's wildly unpopular. Yet they passed it, and it was not hard for them to do so because they have a majority, right? It's dead on, dead on arrival in the Senate, thankfully, um, but we need to be mindful. So there are a couple of things that we need to do here. First of all, you can, you can thank your representative, uh, Tim Burchett, for opposing the Equality Act. He obviously voted against it. Uh, along with most Republicans. Unfortunately, <clears throat> fortunately, um, about a dozen, uh, actually no, I think it was eight uh, Republicans voted in favor of it uh, when it went through the House. Uh, now the day of the vote, so just to clue you guys in on how, how that broke down, right? Our strategy was to try to keep as many Republican votes off of that as possible. Because we do not want this to be a bipartisan issue. We don't want to give any credence to this approach uh, legislatively to the left. We don't want to give this any kind of momentum whatsoever. Um, the last thing we need is, you know, for, you know, God forbid, let's say the Senate flips, and the first thing they would do is ram stuff like this right through, right? We don't want them to say, okay, hey, this is bipartisan, let's go ahead and do this. It's, it's, it's easy to do. Up to the day of the vote, we were worried that for up to maybe as many as 20 Republicans were going to vote for this thing, right? But thanks to Sentinels and grassroots activists all around the country talking to members, talking about the crazy uh, uh, outcomes that this bill would put into place, uh, we got that number down to eight. Okay, so our goal was 12, we did even better than that. So thankfully we kept as many members off as possible, and those eight Republicans who voted for it uh, are members who basically vote with Democrats on most things. Uh, it's, it's not surprising, and one of them was a co-sponsor of the bill, so we were never going to get him. You know, ask yourselves why a Republican member of Congress is on that, but these are not conservatives, in other words. Right? Uh, long story short, thank your representative for opposing it, but also encourage him to keep his eye out, because think of the Equality Act, H.R. 5, the thing that they passed as the whole pie, right? They'd be ecstatic to get the whole thing in one fell swoop, but they'd also be just as happy to slice it up and insert it into 
this bill or that bill or little portions of it and get it into federal law other ways. Just uh, this past week, or the, or the 4th of July, right before 4th of July, um, they inserted uh, these SOGI policies into the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, so basically, inserting that into the defense of our nation, basically turning the military into a, uh, a social experiment. Um, but they're going to try to include this into all kinds of must-pass bills, bills that you know, they'll say, oh, we've got to pass this funding bill, or um, you know, it'll be the end of the world, everybody will die if we don't pass this, right? The stakes are going to be high for Republicans to vote for bills like that. It's very hard for Republicans to vote against a, an omnibus bill or a spending bill that's going to keep the government from shutting down, for example, or a bill that has really, really popular things in it uh, or things that are important for that member's district, right? So they're going to put a lot of good things in a bill and then tuck some bad things like these SOGI policies in with it because they know that members are not going to vote against it. Um, so we need to be mindful for that. They're already doing it. It's a strategy they employ, have been doing for years, but make no mistake, they're not going to stop until they get this law on the books in some way, shape, or form. It's coming. They're going to use that as a weapon against really anyone who disagrees with them. And unfortunately, it's by 80% of the American people. But that's where we are. So be on the lookout. In addition to that, keep talking about the negative consequences. Because just like the Born Alive Bill, we've got to change hearts and minds. And in this case, a lot of people agree with this already, right? We need to be talking about these specific consequences, whether it be parents having their rights taken away from them, having their children taken away, whether it be medical providers, whether it be business owners, what have you. When you talk about the actual consequences of it, now when, when Democrats say, oh, we need to pass the Equality Act, how can anyone be opposed to equality, right? That's all they'll say, and that might pull fine, right? But if you start talking about these individual consequences, they're wildly unpopular. So we need to be talking about that and make those things toxic. So that's the strategy for that. Are there questions on this bill? back there. So as I understand this, am I too loud now? No. Uh, as I understand this, our five-year-old daughter, or I'm sorry, our five-year-old granddaughter, if she went to the bathroom, someone who just decides they want to be a woman today could go into the bathroom too, and there's really nothing you can say or do to prevent that to happen? Correct. Yeah. And in fact, if they, if a Let's say this restaurant, uh, instead of having men's and women's restrooms, if they did that, they would likely be found to be uh, violating federal civil rights law. That would be bad news for them. I was actually a good example uh, along that thread. Um, I was talking to a pregnancy center uh, director and their employees not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, um, and I told them about this bill and how it would impact them. And uh, so, just to give an example of how this works, beyond just the bathroom example, they happen to have a position for like a finance director or something open. And they're faith-based, they're a Christian organization, they're Bible-believing. In order to work there, you have to agree with their statement of faith, um, you have to um, support their mission to try to save as many babies as possible and provide mothers with alternative options to abortion. Well, uh, if this goes into effect, basically, let's say they had two applicants for that finance that finance director position, right? They have two resumes. The resumes are identical, except one of the people happens to be in a same-sex relationship. Uh, the other agrees with their mission statement, their, their uh, statement of faith. If they were to hire the person who agrees with their statement of faith over the person who happened to be in a same-sex relationship, uh, they would likely be found to be in violation of federal law, and they would have the full force of the federal government come down on them. They would be totally open to a lawsuit by the other person. They'd probably lose. Um, now, I think that this is blatantly unconstitutional, um, and hopefully, the court somewhere will strike it down. But guys, we cannot rely on the courts, the judicial system, to save our skins on this, right? All it takes is for one bad ruling. They can shop this policy around to any circuit they want. They get the right judges, and then the Supreme Court may decline to hear it, or if they do, they may take forever to do it, or. God forbid they may come down on it and allow it to stay somehow. Uh, it's not outside their own possibility. We cannot allow uh, this stakes are too high to let the uh, Supreme Court decide this for us. We've got to be sure and fight this tooth and nail. But yeah, it's crazy that the lengths that they'll go to. Well, will there be any 
Will there be any provision in this about somebody who flip-flops to use this to their advantage? For instance, people who get jobs, leave them and they get another job, leave them get another job. If it's their advantage to be bisexual and on this job application and not on this one, and they start flip-flopping back and forth, is there any provision to prevent somebody from doing that? In other words, is there a way to keep somebody consistent once you make up your mind? No. I mean, like I said, the definitions that we're talking about here, they're fluid over time. I mean, what I could identify as right now, theoretically, could change five seconds from now, right? And there's, it would not only be, uh, uh, you would not only be unable to, to do that, literally, you would be a bigot and in violation of federal law if you try to nail them down to whatever the position is, right? So that, like, by their own definition, you can't nail somebody down to a particular definition. And that's why this is so great. Yeah, good question. Are there more? Questions on this? Absolutely crazy. <laughs> Your question was: Has this nation gone absolutely crazy? Yes. 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 I think no. Uh, large portions of the American public, yes, have absolutely gone absolutely nuts. The left wing of the Democratic Party is off, off the charts. I mean, they are nowhere near where the voting public are on this. Uh, Harry Jackson's actually done a lot of polling in swing districts and swing states. And some of the things that Democrats are talking about, especially in this presidential debate, um, on these very issues that we're talking about, are way outside the realm of what Democrat, even Democratic voters find acceptable. They're going to a place where a lot of voters can't follow them. Now, they're making it really easy for Republicans to come and say, hey, that's crazy. Here's a better way to do this. Here is a conservative approach to this. We don't need to be doing this at the federal level. Not only that, it's unconstitutional. Uh, this is absurd. Fight this. So we need to highlight how absolutely crazy these positions are. That's our long-term strategy. Going into 2020, what can we do? Like I said, highlight the craziness of their positions, but also try to fracture the Democrat base. Now, they're, they're the Democratic Party in Congress especially. They're doing a great job of this already by themselves. You've got uh, you know, the squad uh, in the news over the past few days. It's almost like a civil war within the Democratic Party now. Um, the more that they're infighting, the better that is for conservatives. The more that we can highlight the craziness of their positions, like AOC's Green New Deal, and um, uh, whether it be single payer health care or uh, the Equality Act, um, being in favor of abortion up to the day of birth. Like, we need to point out how crazy these positions are, and the American people agree. It's going to be pretty easy to take advantage of that, and hopefully electorally take back some seats in Congress as a result. Good question. Are there more? I've got one last thing that I wanted to cover. I've got a few minutes left, and then we'll do just regular Q&A. Um, but if there aren't any, we'll hold it till the end. I've got a couple minutes left here. The last thing I wanted to talk about is the debt limit and spending caps, because it's in the news at this moment. Um, this is not going to be as long drawn out as the other two things that I talked about, but uh, I did want to kind of go through this uh, to be prepared when you're reading these news reports. So. First of all, the debt limit and spending caps, they oftentimes get lumped together and talked about in the same uh, breadth of air, sometimes in the same half of the sentence, right? Uh, they're actually two different issues, um, and it's important that we keep them separate and understand what they're, what they're talking about. So the debt limit, which is what I'll talk about first, it's how much debt the United States government can accumulate. It's literally a dollar amount that uh, the government can take on of debt to either pay for services or pay debt payments, what have you. If the limit is reached, the government will then either default on debt payments, so they'll, they'll stop making those payments, or they'll stop uh, paying for government services or both. Um, basically, they can uh, shift around funds and make it work in what's called extraordinary measures. Uh, the Treasury Department can, as long as it's within that overall limit, uh, they can shift around funds and uh, make it work for a limited time. Uh, but the deadline for doing that, it looks like uh, it's going to run in early September. It's when they can no longer have any room to shuffle monies around, accounts around. Uh, and at that point, like I said, either the government will default on debt payments or stop paying for government services or both. Um, so that's the debt limit. Uh, now, spending caps. Spending is, is different from debt. Uh, debt is how much they can borrow. Spending is how much con uh, Congress okays to actually spend on any given thing. Um, and in 2011, Congress passed the Budget Control Act, which basically uh, was a deal to raise the nation's debt limit while curbing spending levels, so keeping spending levels at a certain amount uh, for a certain amount of time. So 
the BCA has slowed the growth of discretionary spending, but uh, it seems like every year and a half or two years, Congress repeatedly undermines the BCA and raises the spending caps uh, and raises spending as a result. So here's, here's an example here. Uh, in 2014 and 15, uh, the Ryan Murray deal uh, blew past the, the BCA caps by 45 billion and 19 billion respectively. In a 16 and 17, like about 50 and 30 billion respectively each year over the caps. Okay, well, these two bars is with uh, Republican control of all, uh, all through, so the House, the Senate, and the White House, right? Unfortunately, in 2018, under President, uh, President Trump, uh, the McConnell Schumer deal raised spending by $143 billion, which is more than Obama ever got. Uh, that's crazy. And do you think that number is big? The Democrats right now have a plan in place to raise that by $357 billion unpaid for over the next two years. So on this scale, it would be like through the ceiling, right? Like it's three, almost three times as big as these red bars is how much they're trying to increase spending. Um, now, what does that mean for us? So uh, as of earlier this week, uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin was uh, meeting with Nancy Pelosi uh, to try to raise the debt limit. <coughs> Uh, the administration, uh, you know, for better or for worse, uh, wants to raise the debt limit because they say, okay, well, we have to, otherwise we're going to default on debt. It's not a popular thing to do, but they say we've got to do that. Uh, meanwhile, Democrats and, and Nancy Pelosi want the budget caps deal to increase spending by $357 billion. Now, they may not get all $357 billion, but they definitely want to raise the caps even more than they have been. Uh, and there's a plan to combine those two things to make that politically tenable for members of Congress to support. So, uh, for lawmakers, pairing an unpopular thing like raising the debt limit uh, that Mnuchin is pushing for with spending increases, think of it, it's not just an overall spending level, but let's say your member of Congress has a you know, really important project in the district or a, um, a really important thing that goes to our district that is important for development or whatever it may be, and if I don't vote for that, constituents are going to be really upset with me. It's pretty easy to get a member of Congress to vote for that bill when it's got parochial interests like that in it, unfortunately. Um, now, when they combine it with raising the debt limit and doing that, both sides get what they want. Everyone can just raise spending and be happy. Unfortunately, uh, Mitch McConnell has been quoted as saying to President Trump in June, basically, no one, is, no one ever lost an election for raising spending. So that's that's how Republican uh, members of Congress kind of view this. Unfortunately, it's not an issue they take seriously. Um, as you can see by that, that chart here, those red bars was under Republican control. Uh, the blue bars was under uh, President Obama. That's a crazy difference there. It's unfortunate that it's not been a bigger priority for Republicans to rein in spending, right? Well, I wanted to put that on your radar, um, and unfortunately, it's crazy here. Uh, we're hearing uh, uh, we're hearing that they may try to attach it to the 9/11 survivor spending bill. It may, that's also been in the news. Maybe you've heard about it. The thing that John Stewart was lambasting people for not giving money to 9/11 uh, first responders. That always passes unanimously in the House. Uh, but they're talking about putting the spending deal, combining it with that. Think about how hard it would be for any member to vote against that 9-11 first responders bill, right? That's, that's what we're dealing with here. Um, so be on the lookout. It's important that members, first of all, care about spending and want to rein it in. Second of all, uh, know what the Democrats want and I mean, hold Republicans accountable. Unfortunately, they're the ones who are allowing the Democrats to move the goalposts and uh, increase spending every time. So without getting too much into the weeds on that, I did want to bring that to your attention, uh, but uh, the ask here is that they should debate the, uh, the debt limit and spending cap separately on the merits. Now, you know, obviously, it's not going to happen that way. Um, it's it's going to be a pre-baked deal like it always is. The administration will come in, talk to uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, hammer out some kind of agreement that rank and file members of Congress will never know about until it comes to the floor probably. And then they'll be forced to either vote for it or vote against some crazy thing that will make them look hideous if they vote against. Um, so it's important to keep that up. Um, are there questions on that or questions about anything that I covered? And while we're doing questions, remember,
you want to become a sentinel or you want more information, please fill this, this little half sheet out and get it to me before you leave. I'd love to follow up with you, talk to you, help, you get, help get you plugged in with other sentinels, help get you getting uh, updates like this and timely action alerts when, it's, when it comes to reaching out to your member of Congress uh, and want to help you be as effective as possible. So fill these out and get them back to me. Are there questions? Okay, anything? we'll ask a couple of questions and we're going to have to cut it off. I'm not going to assume anything. You guys still run the scorecard on the individual? Yes, we are. Okay, mm -hmm. back to the blunt doctor. Okay, enough said on that. Um, when's the next time the XM bank comes up? I know it's like a weird period of time. So the Senate actually just uh, uh, confirmed a couple of nominees to the board, so they have a quorum now. Uh, unfortunately, President Trump nominated people to that and gave them a quorum so they can now begin making larger loans again. Um, at this point, we're trying to figure out what the next step is, whether it be to try to reform the bank, whether it be uh, uh, next time, a obviously next time a board position goes vacant, we don't want them to maintain a quorum. Um, but for those of you who don't know, without getting into too much detail, the Export Import Bank is a really cronyist organization in the government that uh, picks winners and losers. In fact, it's actually more like corporate welfare for Boeing and Caterpillar and other huge multinational corporations, uh, basically giving them sweetheart deals that are backed by taxpayer dollars. Gives them loans to be able to export or import goods to other countries, uh, and I mean, that's protectionism. It's it's, it's cronyism mainly, uh, and it's not it's not the free market. So, uh, what's the time period? If it's not four years, five, no. seven years. Or so, honestly, I don't know what the time period is at this point. Since they have a quorum, uh, I don't know what their terms are. I think it might be four years, but I could be wrong. I'll have to check. Five or seven times something. Yeah, it's a weird. No, I'll have to check, and I'll be wrong if I say a number, but. I'll be happy to, to figure it out. And if you give me your email, I'll definitely follow up with the answer. So that's a good question. We okay, got one more back here. Yep. Obviously, this is a time that we all have to wake up and speak up. Yeah. I've never, ever seen anything like this. We are coming to a crossroads <coughs> to save this country. We are against oh, so much, like David versus Goliath. And particularly where conservative voices are being silenced, either on social media, whatever way. And I, I think the Congressman Birch is going to be here next month. And Marsha Blackburn, who is uh, taking a lead role along with Josh Hawley on the social media bias and things, especially going on right now before the, the election, that we are being quiet and quiet. Quite you know, we're being silenced. What can we do? What realistically can be done about this? So we've already actually seen um, Facebook and especially Twitter, they'll you know make a mistake and and you know block somebody or, or shut them off or ban them or whatever, and then it turns out to be oh you know we misapplied this or it's a mistake. Um, actually, market forces have done a great job so far of calling them out. Now I'm not going to say that that. That may be enough. Uh, it remains to be seen. But the more that we speak out, you know, we're not going to be silenced. And we've seen conservatives get their bans overturned. Now, that's not to say necessarily that there's not a larger problem going on. Uh, but for the meantime, the more that we can speak out, the more that we can share on social media, the more that we can stick, honestly, for our beliefs, like you mentioned. I mean, this is not a, a game anymore. It's never been a game. But the stakes can never, have never been higher than right now. We've got to continue to fight. Don't allow ourselves to be silenced by the left. Uh, and stick up our principles. So uh, I think we're about out of time here. Thank you guys for having me tonight. Uh, really, really like I said, if you have these sheets, you could get filled out and turned in to me before you, uh, before you head out of here. I'll be sure and reach, reach out either by phone or email, follow up with you. We'd love to get you plugged in. But thank you guys for having me. Okay, so I've got a couple more things. Uh,
We're looking at Tim Burgess, uh, trying to get him or we try to get Marsha Blackburn. She can't make it, but if we can't get Tim, uh, her chief of staff will be coming to speak with us in August. So I want to thank you for coming. If you have any questions, I'm sure James will be hanging around a little bit, and he can uh, talk to you. If you have any questions of us, come on up and we'll be done.